that 1930s guy here at the house of John Roosevelt, who was Teddy Roosevelt's first cousin. They had the same grandfather. Uh, you might think in this wonderful looking mansion that uh, I'm somewhere on the North Shore of Long Island. Oh, maybe out, out east of the Hamptons, but I'm actually in the town of Sayville on the South Shore. And Sayville has a uh, surprisingly rich history. Now, I've gone through some towns, Ronkonkoma and Brentwood, lately. I guess this is sort of a series I'm going through. I didn't intend it. But uh, I'm going to tell some a couple interesting Sayville stories uh, from the 30s. Uh, I just figured I'd start here because most people don't know this uh, house is here. John Roosevelt really has nothing to do with uh, what I am discussing today. It's just a really nice property. It's on a right next to a lake and a creek. Uh, the house is actually open for tours, but only on Saturdays. But, uh, John Roosevelt, he wasn't really a famous figure. He was a Wall Street lawyer. And he had kind of a, a tragic uh, existence. Uh, his first wife died very young of typhoid. When I say very young, I, she was in her 40s. She was like really young, but you know, it's an unfortunate thing. It was becoming less common in the early 20th century, but she still died of it. I think it was 1914. And with her, she had three kids and two of those kids died uh, even younger than the wife died. Uh, one fell off a horse in her 20s. She had, he had three daughters. Uh, another one uh, went, went insane, went, was sent to an insane asylum uh, when she was only like in her teens. And she also, she died around age, uh, age 40, 45. And one lived a, a normal, uh, full, the youngest one actually lived a normal full life. But after the, uh, his first wife died, he married Another wife, when it was a disaster, he, he tried to get the marriage uh, annulled, saying that, you know, she didn't uh, represent who she really was. And uh, But um, he lost the battle, and even though they never really uh, spent t much time together, he was forced to pay alimony for the rest of his life, $400 a month for the rest of his life to her. Uh, he died in 1939. But today I'm going to talk about two more interesting figures. Uh, one is about is first I'm going to go to Father Divine. And you don't know who Father Divine is. Uh, he is a very interesting character. And we're going to go to the place he lived in Sayville, where he really became famous in, while he was in Sayville. He lived here for uh, 12 years, pushing 13. And I'm going to talk about a priest in Sayville, who was a little overzealous about enforcing uh, the Legion of Decency's uh, moral standards on films. So let's get started. I'm now in the residential section of Sayville, where Father Divine used to live. Now, Father Divine was a very interesting character, probably the most famous one to come from Sayville or lived in Sayville, and, and that includes Marlon uh, Brando, Brando and Melissa Joan Hart, who also came from Sayville. Well, they, well, Marlon Brando, I don't think, was born here, but he lived here. But anyway, Father Divine, he was born in 1876, I believe, they believe his name was George Baker, but that has not been proven. That was his real name. Uh, but it also, uh, it's not proven where he was born. Some say Georgia, some say Maryland. Records are, are hard to find. And uh, he studied to be a preacher. Uh, and eventually he came to Georgia, in Valdosta, Georgia, and made his own s s sect of Christianity, uh, where he said he was... God. He was a descendant. He was given uh, power from God the Father uh, as a sort of new Jesus. But he was very charismatic and wherever he went throughout his life he gained popularity 
and was very uh, generally uh, well liked by everyone who knew him personally. And it, unfortunately, uh, the Georgia authorities really didn't like him very much. They uh, saw him as a radical, so they declared him a lunatic and put him in a chain gang. And so as soon as he got done with his term, he went to Brooklyn, uh, where he met his wife, Penina. And eventually he came to this house right here. And this is in Sable in 1919. Now he's married, which is interesting because he preached part of the, one of the main tenets of his religion was celibacy. Also, no drinking, no drugs. You have to live a clean life, and uh, but most importantly, no sex. And he claimed, even though he was married twice, that he never had sex with either one of his wives. Interesting in itself. But anyway, uh, this house he got, he was the first um, black person to be a homeowner in Sayville. The town is still 95% white. And he... Uh, got this house because the two neighbors were feuding. One wanted to sort of destroy the value of the houses in the neighborhood. And so he sold, when he uh, advertised to sell his house, he, in the, the lingo of the day, it was only to be sold to a person, what we would call a person of color, what they would call a colored person. And so that's how Father Divine was able to get the house. And it was here where he reached big fame, big money, big fame, a huge following. He used to preach right here in this house, have gatherings, singing events. Uh, just before he moved here, he changed his name uh, officially to Major Jealous. And he picked Jealous because in the Bible it says God is a jealous God. And I guess he liked that concept, so he named himself Jealous. But everyone knew him as Father Divine because he was supposed to be... Uh, of, di of divinity so that's what he was referred to throughout his life and he used to have um, sermons here quite frequently would draw crowds from New York City and uh, the people in the neighborhood uh, began to not like all this attention that he was getting here, the crowds that were crowding this small town. And so they looked for something to charge him with. And in 1931, May 8th, 1931, uh, because of the singing that went on, although he claimed it never, they never sang after nine o'clock, uh, uh, it was a public disturbance. And so he got charged with disturbing the peace and was sent to trial the trial was moved to Nassau County because his he had a lot of money. He was able to pay a thousand dollar cash bail to get out to, to begin with, which in 1931 that was pretty good. Had that much money on you, he must have had a lot. He also owned several cars. He was famous for driving around in, in his uh, shiny Cadillac around Sayville, where the streets uh, we're walking on right now. But anyway, uh, yeah, the trial that he moved to Nassau because they didn't think he'd get a fair trial in Suffolk. So uh, finally, the trial was delayed for a long time. Didn't start till 1932. And the jury found him guilty, but they told the judge for leniency. Uh, and the judge completely ignored their call for leniency and gave the maximum penalty that anyone could get for disturbing the peach which was a year in jail and a $500 fine. So he had to go to jail for a year for something he claims didn't do. But, uh, you know, racism was pretty prevalent in society and they probably were not very happy to have a rich black person in predominantly white Long Island and bringing in all these people from the city. Oh, his followers were, were multiracial, though. He was known to have both white and a large amount of white and black followers. But anyway, after that he decided he was done with Sayville and he moved into Harlem. And that's where he was really at his peak.
continuing our story from the heart of Sable, downtown area. And it's a nice, uh, quaint little downtown, uh, very historic. You don't always see these sort of old style main streets uh, everywhere on Long Island. Just certain towns like Patchogue and Sayville and several others. Ronkonkoma has one, but it's not quite as lengthy and well kept, I should say, historically preserved, that's the word, as this one. But getting back to Father Divine. Father Divine, actually there was one good thing from his uh, year in jail, the overly harsh punishment that he had, and that was that uh, he helped his own reputation because after he was sentenced to the year, the judge, five days later after the, the harsh sentencing, was given, was had a heart attack and died. And Justice, the uh, Father Divine actually took credit for it. Uh, he said he didn't want to kill him, but uh, yeah, his heart was so hard, uh, he just couldn't, he couldn't get through to him spiritually, so uh, he uh, had to uh, give him a heart attack, <laughs> which is pretty funny. But uh, it, it turns out that the, you know, the judge actually had heart problems for some time, so it wasn't that much of a shock, but uh, he used it uh, to gain a, a more following when he went to Harlem. And... Harlem uh, represented the peak of his career, but as with many people, uh, once you reach your peak, the problems start. And he had uh, several issues that weren't necessarily his fault. Uh, one was one of his followers was crazy. Uh, it's a rich guy, rich white guy in California, actually, uh, was a devout follower. And he uh, had delusions himself and he kidnapped a 17 year old from Denver, Colorado, who he claimed uh, was the reincarnation of the Virgin Mary. Uh, even though Father Divine did not preach reincarnation, but this is what this crazy guy said. Uh, <laughs> his name was John Hunt, I believe. And he. Uh, Eventually, they, they caught the guy. Uh, the, he completely brainwashed this this young girl. Uh, he also, well, because he had sexual relations with, with her, they were able to charge him with the Man Act and send him to jail. Uh, but the whole scandal, Father's Divine, was always mentioned. And there's a lot of newspapers, because of his sensational cult following uh, love to uh, poke fun at him and take every advantage they could of, of anything negative that people said about him or any negative events like this one so they they did their best to tie this to him even though he had nothing to do with it uh, sort of uh, reflecting uh, his follow what his followers are like that they're all crazy like this guy is even though they weren't uh, he actually did a lot of good things, Father Divine. Uh, he used some of his money to purchase uh, locations and goods and charge them only at cost to his followers so they could save money. They wouldn't get have to pay retail prices for goods. And uh, he, uh, you know, did... Uh, donate a lot to charities as well so he, he wasn't uh, although he, th he thought he was God he was not necessarily the most selfish guy in the world but more troubles came uh, somebody each one in his cult they they all had their own uh, interesting divine names one of them uh, was called Mary faithful Mary that was it and she left and created problems by telling newspapers all this uh, that he was a fake uh, phony that she knew him behind the scenes and had relations with him and that you know he wasn't celibate that he took advantage of a lot of the 
people in his cult, a lot of the women, and basically just trashed him. And so that hurt his reputation as well. And then he was sued by somebody who claimed that he was holding their money while he, when he still lived in Safeville, he took their money and said he was going to protect it for them and he just stole it. Uh, they went through the courts for a while. Eventually he was found guilty and he had to leave New York because he didn't want to be arrested. And so he uh, moved to Philadelphia where he would spend the rest of his life. Uh, made, bought a big property, did his sermons there and the place where he does is actually still there. And they, his uh, cult, which has a name, it's called the International Peace Movement. That's the name he gave to it in the 20s. Still has that name. You could check out their website. They're still there. Uh, still believe in the divinity of Father Divine. And, uh, but anyway, uh, his wife eventually died in 1943. He had one last controversy after that where uh, he remarried one of his followers who was a 21 year old Canadian girl and this was controversial because he was 71 at the time there's a half a century age difference between these two so uh, even, even 1940s, I mean, they accepted older marriages more than they do today, but not that big of a gap it was still kind of not uh, kind of frowned upon. So, but she kind of carried on his legacy. Uh, the infamous Jim Jones actually made an attempt to get his followers saying he, re, uh, he took over the spirit of Father Divine. When Father Divine died, his spirit went into Jim Jones. That's what Jim Jones claimed. Uh, but it didn't really work. Uh, so his young wife uh, carried it on and she just recently died in 2017, actually. Uh, she stayed in uh, the place in Philadelphia where their headquarters is at. And though he kind of dwindled out of the news uh, after the negative publicity in the 30s, it went, his uh, popularity went down. He didn't have that many followers and eventually he just kind of faded away. Here's the very old Sayville Theater. In 1934, when the movie companies were pressured to follow the production code by the Legion of Decency, and I'll, I'll discuss that a little more in a minute, but uh, there was a zealous member of, of the Catholic Church here named Reverend James A. Smith. And he would actually come to this theater, stand in front, and look for patrons of his church to try to see movies that uh, the Legion of Decency labeled as indecent, I guess would be the word. And uh, so, and he was sort of the uh, policeman of the movies in Sayville, but only for his congregants. And he talked with the manager of the, of the theater at the time and said, you know, it's nothing against you. I'm not trying to boycott. You know, anyone can see your films. I'm not gonna mess with anyone that isn't a part of our church. But if they are part of our church, I'm gonna tell them they shouldn't be here. And if they are here, 
they should find another church to go to because they're sinning. <laughs> and uh, the whole episode uh, was interesting. You didn't really see people that overzealous in most of the country, but the Legion of Decency was founded by Catholics around the country, and they did force more or less the movies to follow the production code that they themselves uh, made uh, back in 1930. They just never really enforced it. It was there, but there was uh, nobody really to make them do it. And in order to get money from more racy subjects, they would uh, film, they would break it all the time until the Legion of Decency had enough uh, of sexual themes, mostly. Uh, they didn't like films that had, you know, bad characters winning, or, you know, uh, prostitution was pretty rampant in, in films as a theme in the early 30s. And, uh, you know, they also didn't like the fact that sometimes they had comic relief characters who were homosexual. And so they, they wanted that out and they got together and said that we're going to pick films out that we believe are indecent and tell our adherents that any good Catholic should not see this film and if they do, they're committing a sin. And so the movies decided uh, more or less to make cleaner films, but there, it's been overemphasized. Like that. You know, a lot of people think that the code in 1934, July 1st, 1934, is when they said they were going to start following the code, and after that, all films were clean. But it was really more of a gradual process. The films were already kind of transitioning. They were way, like any uh, business people, they weighed the decision whether it was worth it, the more people they would get from racy films versus the people that would boycott it for religious reasons. So, uh, they actually were changing. At the time in 1934, when they started enforcing the code, they were doing more uh, historic subjects were coming in. Shakespearean plays, uh, some of the hits like Little Women in 1933 with Katharine Hepburn, and you had uh, Anne of Green Gables in 1934, that was a big hit. Where very calm, calmer themes like Tom Sawyer and yeah, other uh, historical time period stuff was uh, coming more popular and they were kind of going to that anyhow. This just kind of uh, sped it up a little bit that put more pressure on them to do it. And there were still some films that didn't follow the code that came out after uh, the code was supposed to be enforced. and. You know, some went out without the seal of approval anyway, like the the cat's paw with Howard Lloyd. Here is Reverend Smith's home base, St. Lawrence the Martyr Catholic Church, right on Montauk Highway. Here in Sable, just west of the uh, sort of downtown area, but he didn't actually go to this building because it was built in 1970, as that sign says. But I figure it's a fitting place to end the video. And of course, before I go, I want to thank everybody for watching. Please like and subscribe if you found this content interesting, and I will be doing more interesting stuff very shortly. Uh, I got working on doing a story about a kidnapping case in Stony Brook uh, that uh, I don't believe was ever solved. I had to do more research on it, but I should make an interesting uh, story we can do right from the site. Thanks for watching.